I think we've got an interesting session here. Um, what we want to do with, with this panel is really focus on, on the unique challenges of growth stage uh, medical device companies. And that's, that's distinct from the development stage companies where aspects such as um, clinical development, regulatory, in some cases reimbursement are what keeps us up at night. Here we want to dive into the, the inherent issues of growth stage companies ranging from corporate infrastructure needs to uh, post-launch sales and marketing strategies and, and ultimately what are the metrics, what are the characteristics that drive strategic interest and, and how do we position a company for a successful exit. So we, we have a, a variety of panelists here um, who are going to introduce themselves in a moment with uh, really uh, distinct perspectives and, and experiences that, that I think will be able to really inform and opine on, on these issues. Um, before I turn it over to them, just to give you a, a brief background, I'm a, um, Michael Wasserman. I'm a managing director with HIG BioVentures. HIG is a private equity fund with about $10 billion in capital under management. Uh, invest across sectors uh, and stages, healthcare being the, uh, the largest industry vertical. Our, our BioVentures fund invests in uh, healthcare broadly defined, uh, biopharmaceuticals, medical devices, diagnostics, and services. Um, and uh, why don't I, I turn it over to the panelists. Dennis, you want to give a sure. start, just introduce yourselves and we'll, we'll walk down the line. Thank you for the invite. My name is Dennis Crowley. I'm the Vice President of Corporate Development at Covidian. Covidian is a uh, $12 billion in revenue medical device pharmaceutical company. We're spinning off our pharmaceutical group in two or three months in the June timeframe. So we're one of the larger medical device companies global and um, been quite active in the acquisition field over the past five, six years. We separated from Tyco International in June of 2007. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is David Mayer. I'm a partner with Abingworth. Um, Abingworth is a longstanding investor in uh, life sciences and <clears throat> we're recently doing uh, much in the way also of healthcare services and healthcare IT. Uh, the firm's based in the UK, although we have an office in Boston and one in San Francisco. Um, uh, we're a multi-stage, uh, multi-sector investor, so we do invest in everything from early stage venture uh, through growth equity, small buyouts, as well as actually have a fairly active public market investing effort as well. Um, and uh, you know, my own uh, time, I spent a lot of time in healthcare services in the past. I'd say more recently, probably spending more time in um, healthcare IT as well as medical technologies. Thank you. My name is Hanny Zaini. I'm the uh, founding CEO of Cientra. I'm going to take uh, the next few minutes to, uh, via the introduction to give you a perspective and tell you the Cientra story. Uh, a little bit. Sientra is a medical device company focused on the aesthetics vertical within the, uh, the, the market. And uh, uh, the thesis when we started Sientra was basically to put a dent in the plastic surgery world. And how we're going to do that is by building a company that provides option and new choices to plastic surgeons, as well as doing business in a different way. And uh, the way we went about it back in 2006, early 2007, the trajectory of the market uh, looked like the runway was uh, endless. There was a lot of money on the side. Aesthetic business was uh, very sexy for people to invest. Everybody wanted to be in that space. Uh, but there weren't too many people who, who, can, who can do things. Uh, uh, it was a perfect opportunity for us. I had just wrapped up my assignment at Enamed. Uh, I came into Enamed in 2001 to run the aesthetics business worldwide. Uh, when we started, it was uh, about a $348 million market cap NASDAQ traded company. And four and a half years later, we sold it to what became Allergan Medical for $3.4 billion. So everybody was excitable and excited about that. And we brought together a, a fantastic group of investors. And the idea was to enter the business. Why? Cash pay, duopoly market and demographic that is accepting the uh, aesthetics procedure and growing widely. And so you look at that, that's a big opportunity. And we used the money in the uh, beginning of 2007, we raised a monstrous round of $86 million and acquired some assets of a company that put us in, in play in the United States to take the product and develop it through a regulatory process with the FDA. Some people think that we lack the judgment because we're glutton for punishment. If you've done it one time with the FDA, get the silicon best plant back on the market, why would you do that again? We saw it as an opportunity. So everything looked fantastically well. And then fast forward 
about 18 months into it, I call them the dark days, the perfect storm, where the financial markets started to spiral out of control. We ended up with a new administration that resulted in an FDA that felt <coughs> on the medical device side that we have gotten away with a lot and there's no sheriff in town. And we discovered also in the assets that we acquired, there are some obstacles in the files that we've acquired. So we had the perfect storm. And from a, a founding CEO point of perspective, I found that this is to be the perfect time where my job was to be the merchant of hope. And it is to make sure that the thesis that we started on stayed center and front of everybody internally, but also for our investor who took a shot at investing in us, we needed to make sure to assure them that their investment is going to continue to be on track. And lastly, the outside market, which have looked at us as coming in to break the duopoly in the marketplace. And they need to be assured that we are actually for real and it's going to come. Uh, there's no substitute for experience. We worked very closely with the FDA at a time that was exceedingly challenging to work with the FDA. And those were really, really dark days to get through. And our approach was to be collaborative instead of confrontational, which is typical in our space, at least on the aesthetics and the breast implants and, and implantable devices. So we got through that. And as we're going through that process, I realized that we need to commercialize. And because it took longer to get there, and knowing that it's going to be longer, what we needed to do is to make sure that we don't end up spending our time and energy when we are approved trying to raise the capital to go commercial. So we embarked on this effort uh, about a year and so before uh, we, we actually get uh, the approval. And we did uh, some interesting twists on financing with stand, standby financing. We, uh, we went out trying to seek money for commercialization. And the standby financing was based on the fact that we're going to de-risk the regulatory milestone from an investment point of view. So for the investors, you don't have to invest unless there is an approvable or approval letter that puts us in the marketplace and allows us to build commercialization. So all of our insiders up there again into that round and we get a new lead, David Mayer from Abingworth, who came and, and led the round uh, for us. And what allowed us to do is that when we actually received the approval, within 100 days, we had on the ground a fully operational sales and market commercial team. And off to the races we went. And that's where we find ourselves <coughs> now. The market has changed a little bit. When we started in 2007, five years prior, and we looked at the modeling and what we had versus when we were actually approved, within those five years, it's a duopoly market. I keep reminding you that has been duopoly for 20 years, two competitors, nothing has changed. Same customer base, same implants, same competitor. The average selling price on the device was 26% less. And so our assumptions had to change, and that's where we find ourselves now in the, in the growth phase of commercially being able to drive and make a difference, and we can talk a little bit more about the things that we do. I will give you a little bit shorter background there. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Bob Bicknees. I'm a managing uh, a director at uh, Rothschild uh, in North America, responsible for North American healthcare uh, practice. Uh, Rothschild is a global uh, financial advisory uh, firm. We specialize in providing independent uh, financial advice, primarily focused on the merger and acquisition uh, side of the market. Um, we also provide uh, financing advice to companies, both um, established companies uh, looking to uh, recapitalize their balance sheet as well as to uh, emerging, uh, emerging companies looking for uh, an appropriate source of, uh, of capital. Um, Rothschild is a large global firm. We've got uh, you know, roughly 900 uh, financial advisors um, sort of worldwide. Uh, we're located in probably 50 different offices throughout the world. Uh, we do, uh, in terms of our M&A rankings, we, we're typically in the top uh, uh, five in terms of number of deals completed uh, year to year, and from a valuation, uh, total value standpoint, we're typically in the top ten. Uh, we obviously do a lot in a lot of different regions. The firm is headquartered in uh, in London, um, but as I said, we have big offices uh, pretty much throughout throughout the world. So we uh, tend to do a, a lot in a lot of different geographic regions, including a lot of cross border activity. Uh, personally, uh, as I said, I, uh, I spent most of my time at uh, Rothschild in the healthcare space. Prior to joining Rothschild about five years ago, I spent about 20 years at Bear Stearns. Uh, the final uh, 10 of those years uh, primarily focused in the healthcare space and predominantly in the medical technology and medical device space. Uh, my name is Mike Minnelli. I'm the CEO of Stanmore Implants. Uh, Stanmore is a company in the orthopedics market principally serving what we call the extreme orthopedics category. And by extreme, what we mean is 
usually uh, last available procedures for limb salvage. And so these are typically oncology patients. They're typically um, very complex revisions, primary orthopedic revisions, and lastly, very complex trauma cases. Uh, and so what I liked, I've, I've only been the CEO for about three or four weeks, but what I really liked about the company was it had a 30-year reputation in the marketplace, principally focused on the UK market. However, because of its expertise in this extreme orthopedic, it had a terrific reputation around the world. It just had never been commercialized. And so <clears throat> a couple of years ago, the company hired a terrific commercialization leader. He's, he's in the room somewhere, Andrew Jones. And he sort of started to demonstrate that these products could be commercialized initially in the UK with a direct sales force. And then in other markets around the world through a distributor model. And then finally, as the uh, FDA started to approve some of these products coming direct into the US market. And so we're pretty excited about the trajectory we're on uh, and what our growth prospects are. We're already almost a $20 million company before really getting started in the US. So we like our chances. It, we think it's about a six or $700 million addressable category right now. And as we broaden our portfolio, uh, we think we can grow that to a billion dollar market category and still not end up in you know, what I call the killing fields where we end up having to compete with big ortho uh, in the primary hip and primary knee space. We want to stay away from that and focus on these, you know, these attractive categories. Another aspect of this is while it's a, there's a tremendous amount of price pressure in the, in the categories of primary hip and primary knee, because of the nature of these procedures, there's very little price pressure. And in fact, we're able to realize integer multiples of, of price over what primary hips or primary knee replacements are. So it's a nice category. It's a reasonably straightforward regulatory path, well reimbursed with a group of specialists in the, in the clinician space that focus on, on treating these, uh, these difficult and challenging patients. Great, thanks everybody. Uh, Dennis, let's start with, with you. You know, Covidian acquires companies' assets of all shapes and sizes from pure play technology to development stage assets all the way through what we're talking about today to commercial stage assets. When you're looking at a commercial stage company, what are the characteristics, what are the metrics that are important to you? Is it, you know, is it truly top line? Do you look at gross margins? How are you thinking of growth rate? What are those characteristics that we as operators or investors in these companies should be thinking about as we try and build value? Okay, um, I think for us, one of, the, one of the first things we look at, is, and it's, it's pretty obvious probably with a lot of people, is, 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 probably, is the growth rate and the sustainability of the growth rate. So as, as we look at the growth stage companies that we come across, we're trying to make assessments internally because I think we, we've had the opportunity to buy, um, we've acquired some growth stage companies and we've also passed on some growth stage companies. Where when we've looked at them, we've tried, when I think one of the hardest things that we're trying to assess, and it's, and, and it's probably, I don't know if it's hard for other people to assess, I hope so, is um, the fact that there's always early adopters in the marketplace and then you're getting a ramp from that basis and we're trying to assess, is it the early, these, these you know, subset of physicians out there who like trying new technology and they'll give you a shot. And then after that, that's it. And you're gonna essentially plateau. And after that, it's just a complete fight um, to, to, to maintain the growth and, and, and the penetration in the marketplace. So, and there, I think there was a good slide from the, the previous presentation when you look at sort of where the market's going. And this is, again, this is hard for us as we start assessing it. You know, some people have sort of the next best widget for some of the products we have, and you look at them and you say, okay, I already have a franchise with that product. How much better are you? And I think if you talk to a lot of people in our company who've been in the industry 20, 30 years, that used to be pretty good. You could just go upcharge and no problem, and everything was great at 10%. At 20%, and you're off to the races. Uh, we've had a lot, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of discussions in our company about <laughs> that strategy and how that's working out now in the marketplace. And so when we look at those, you start, you, you start saying, what are you really doing? And we, we do a lot of KOL meetings, 
And um, I thought it was interesting to give you some, some sort of internal baseball. Um, and it wasn't a product that we had, but we were discussing potentially a market we want to get into. And one physician brought up, and I think this is a good example of a key, you know, someone who's an early adopter. He, he's working on this one product. Oh, he's like, great technology. It's, it's really cool. It does this, it does that. And another, uh, one of his peers looked at him and said, okay, how, you know, first of all, how much more effective is it? And it's just slightly more effective, but the price point is probably 10 times what he's buying now because the other products that they're doing. He goes, I have, no, I have no intention of buying that. Even though this has two or three features which are new to the marketplace, there's no way my, my hospital system will even touch that. And you can see the look on the guy's eye. He's like, that's interesting because, you know, again, the price point was very different. Now, on top of that, and, and, and this is the hard thing, I think, in the marketplace nowadays, is, is the technology to actually change how a practice is run? And that's what's, you know, a lot of what we look at is how can we change someone's practice? Because that's where you get the order of magnitude to take cost savings out of the system. But I think in all the other discussions you had today, it's pretty hard to find out what that means to a hospital system and where they're thinking of how to take this money out and how hard it is to go into a hospital system and change the way they practice. And for us, that's where I think we've also, it's very difficult for us to be able to assess that because we look at something and say, this will change how physicians practice. This is great, let's go do it. We get out there and, and start, you know, we acquire a company, we have a lot of marketing strength and feed on the street. We start trying to change that practice, it's pretty hard. And that's for us. I can imagine a smaller company trying to, again, demonstrate that and be able to do that. We have a hard time doing that sometimes because, you, again, you have the ingrained inertia in certain systems that even though there's a savings there, sometimes it's not as clear as it needs to be. And also you are working against a, a sort of a practice or a way of doing things that doesn't work very well. So sorry for a little bit longer. No, no, that's that. great. It, 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 maybe Dave to follow up on that. You know, at, with your portfolio or, or with specific companies, in a growth stage company, are you looking to just build a good, solid, sustainable business with the right levels of growth, the right levels of market share, or are you really developing these companies to make them <coughs> attractive to somebody like Dennis or the, uh, the other consolidators? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most of us in this room would agree that if you're investing in devices, whether it's early or late, you're, you're more likely thinking your exit, whatever your time frame is, is going to be a sale to a Covidian or, or the like. I don't think there's many of us anymore that necessarily think it's going to be an IPO or just build some long, sustainable private company. So, and I think, <clears throat> you know, certainly when you look at devices, but particularly the, the nature of this conference is around growth stage. And so, you know, to me, that kind of means quasi-commercial either, you know, you're either a commercial business now or you're at that inflection point where you're about to go commercial. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the value creation, I believe, for the investor does come on the exit. I mean, we could, you know, we can, on diligence, you, you study a lot, you do a lot of work, and then when you're working with the company, there's inevitably all kinds of issues you get wrestling with. But when you really look back over history, you make your money or you don't on the exit. Um, and so I think to a large degree, that depends on what do you think drives value on an exit? And to some degree then, are you spending your time both in your, was your initial investment decision taking those factors into consideration and then how well did you work with the company? to um, create the things that are within your control to then drive that value. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the things that I think from our standpoint, and there's no right or wrong answer that we tend to focus on, one is IP. Um, you know, certainly the stronger your IP position, the better you feel. I will say today, I don't know if IP in a lot of cases is as relevant as it once was. We can talk about that later. Um, I think having reimbursement established, in my mind, is probably as important or even more important today than IP, um, because you can get approval, but yet if you're not gonna get paid for it or adequately, um, that changes a lot of your, a lot of your assumptions. Um, revenue ramp rate, clearly, if we're talking about commercial assets, you need to grow the business. And as a potential buyer, <clears throat> and I think the, the point that was brought up about um, those early adopters is very relevant. A lot of times when we see a later stage device deal, when I say later stage, I mean has revenues, period. I mean, whether it's eight million or six. Um, you know, there's always, I mean, you know, there's kind of this, this factor I think you see in some growth companies where um, it's almost like a wedge of cheese, you know, it's like the revenues are growing, you keep having to invest, and every year it's going to be your break-free break year and your cash flow positive, but you don't quite get there, but oh, by the way, we did grow, so it's working. And you kind of get into this trap, and so I think your point as an investor, depending on where on the life cycle you're looking to invest, you really have to be conscious about, is this in fact a scalable business with a large yeah. market opportunity, um, or are we just kind of being led to believe that based on some of these, these early adopters? Um, you know, that speaks also to another relevant point, which is, again, just customer and, and uh, uh, you know, in this case, provider and consumer adoption. 
um, I think your point you made as well is another key one, which is, you know, does this factor into the provider's practice, how they run their business? Um, are there economic motivations we need to consider in terms of how it impacts them directly? Um, so I think, you know, provider adoption clearly goes into, ties into a lot of these issues. Um, market size. You know, I think a lot of times in devices you do come across these little niche products which can be really exciting. Uh, and from a science or a clinical standpoint, you get really excited. And frankly, there might be a true clinical benefit to patients. Um, but just given the time and money it now takes to get a product through FDA, um, if you don't have a meaningful enough market to generate the kind of revenues um, and the scalable, you know, kind of recurring revenue model later, I just don't know how desirable that is to potential buyers. Um, and I guess the last point I'd say is really it's just that kind of strategic or scarcity value. Um, you've done it, you've done it well, but, is it, but are there four other guys doing the same thing? Or like you said, are there um, different iterations of the same thing? I feel like in interventional cardiology, there was a period where, you know, you're going to use hot or do you use cold? And, you know, I just think that when it comes time to really get that premium exit, I think if you focus in on businesses and opportunities where if you get it right, you're the only guy that's really there, um, you know, not surprisingly, I think it's probably a better outcome from a value standpoint. So, again, none of that's, you know, you, you can do all that easily, but I mean, those are just, I think, some of the, the, the bullets that we try and think about when we're uh, thinking about, you know, how to really make money on an exit, which is, I think, where you make your money. No, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Hanny, uh, maybe you can take a shot at this, and, and Michael, as, uh, as the other CEO on the panel, uh, feel free to follow up after. You know, as we're looking to build our companies through these stages, there's often a push-pull uh, of some of the key growth metrics that define the business. There's top-line revenue, path to profitability, growth rate, and so forth. Uh, and, and they're not necessarily uh, consistent with each other. In other words, I, I can certainly think of a number of situations in my own portfolio where we as a board, when we're sending out a budget for a given year, are, thinking, are, are, are debating that concept of, do we want to resource this company to just drive that growth and drive that top line, or are we starting to really focus more on how long it's going to take us to get to, uh, to, to profitability? How do you think about that in your own business and as you try and scale upwards? Um, what's most important to you as you're trying to build value in the, uh, in the business and the assets it's have? Great. Uh, maybe I'm fortunate or unfortunate, but I operate in a different environment than what Dennis and, <laughs> and, and, and Mike was talking about. And, and the reality is that I operate in a cash business. I'm not beholden to reimbursement. I came from a pharmaceutical background and managed care and GPOs and all that. So I've been liberated the last 13 years. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 and I, op I operate in, a, uh, in an environment where skill is still a big part of the process and the procedure. So we're part of that value proposition that is delivered to the patient. And we're also specialized in terms of it's a, it's, it's a well-defined marketplace that we operate in, and you know who the niche players are in that market. So our metrics is my belief in our space. We need to get out of the gate, and we need to get out of the gate fast. And we need to establish ourselves, because in, in our case, we're up against two large competitors in J&J &J and Allergan. And we believe that we can compete effectively, and we have for the past 12 months since we've been on the market. But what you need to do, my belief, I'm a great believer in momentum. <coughs> you need to work very hard, and when you talk about resourcing, the resourcing <coughs> is not just about building a big organization, but rather resourcing to get a momentum going. Because what we have seen time and again, before when I was at Enamed and now at Ciantra, is once you get that momentum going, you can feed it and it feeds on itself just because of the environmental condition that we operate in. And so growth is very important for us. Market share is very important for us. And the pathway to profitability and cash independence is, is, is very critical. And the last thing is just, I, I wrote it down because it, it resonated with me. There's a great article in the Harvard Business Review currently in this current issue by Michael <coughs> Rainer and Mumtaz Ahmed. It's about the three rules for marketing or making great company truly great. And I love this because they talk rule number one, better before cheaper, which means is have a superior non-price benefit that differentiate in convenience and functionality versus having incremental change in a product that you are the lowest price. The second rule is revenue before cost. You cannot you cannot drive yourself by being cost leadership. You cannot drive yourself into sustainable, superior profitability. 
So what you have to do is you really have to grow the top line and do it in a capturing all those benefits from the better versus cheaper, benefit those and capture those in a revenue model that is sustainable. And lastly, the, the rule number three, there are no other rules. <laughs> and so so that, that, was, that, was, that was fantastic, to be honest with you, and very applicable to what we do. Yeah. Uh, uh, Michael, uh, yeah, Hanny made probably you and the rest of the room jealous by talking about <laughs> behaving yeah. in, a, uh, in a cash <laughs> environment, not having to worry about reimbursement. Does your context make that a different thought process in terms of, of the metrics and what's driving you? Yeah, I think uh, what, what I like to focus on is um, revenue quality um, because I think re revenue quality in terms of are we uh, are we building a franchise of users or are we building a f are we building a collection of samplers and, and and I think in talking to strategics building a franchise of users is much more valuable than a collection of samplers even if the collection of samplers represents a larger revenue number um, and so I think, I think that's important. I think the other thing increasingly is, even if the product is FDA approved, we have to, we, we think it's important on an ongoing basis to continue to collect comparative economic and clinical effectiveness uh, to, to, to further add to our body of, of, of science. And, and I think lastly is we, we need to sort of be continuously validating the category that we serve. Because a lot of times our view of the category may differ from the large strategic who maybe hasn't paid much attention to the category and then all of a sudden we're talking about this as something that you know is larger than they anticipated and now they're a little bit on the defensive. So we need to sort of be sure that we're, we're, we're building you know, market validation uh, as we as we move along along uh, along the way. How do you, and maybe this goes back to Dennis's earlier comment. <coughs> how do you figure out the user versus sampler? You know, all of us, uh, mm -hmm. whether on the operating side or investing side or banking or, or strategic, when you're looking at an asset or a new technology, and you talk to the docs, you talk to the buyers, uh, you get this uh, histogram of we call it the cowboy scale. And it's particularly relevant in orthopedics because mm -hmm. you've got folks who want to try every new toy and then you've got the 65-year-old orthopod who thinks, you know, I cut here, I cut there, I, I join them by a big piece of metal and they're right. buying for 15 years. Right. Um, you know, how do you sort through that and, and figure out whether or not you've got this sustainable growth yeah. that Dennis was referring to earlier. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it's as complex and simple in our case as we, we have a list of customers that we start working with and we monitor their usage. And if we see a drop off after, after some startup period, we're going in and talking to these customers and trying to understand why. And we can quickly find out, are we dealing with, <coughs> with, a, with a, you know, a gadget enthusiast? Or are we dealing with somebody that's really trying to incorporate a new product into their into their routine practice? And we see it, you know, we, we do see them drop off very quickly. Um, and uh, and for those that continue to use, you know, we we get traction and we get an increasing share of the of the procedures that they they kind of draw away from whatever they were using before to to, to what we now offer. Can anybody else? Uh, no, I mean, no, to that point, you know, on some of the diligence we'll do, you're right, we, we try to, in the right way, find the people who have fallen off, and you go to them and you start saying, so why'd you fall off, to say, you know, is this, is this the beginning of the trend where everyone's right. just going to follow it over time, and exactly. it's just like, yep, they're getting out, they're getting out, they're getting out, yeah. and it's, you know, it's, it's a good point, because that's, it's, it's one, again, it's a hard thing to really yeah. dig into, and it's, and, um, you know, we work hard to, to be able to make those assessments, and it's right. just, um, we just, we found it so many times of, um, because we also deal with a lot of the, the people who like to know the technologies and, you, and you, they get so excited and we always try to pull in the people who just sit there and shake their head and like, eh, don't worry about <laughs> it. Know, it's gonna go by the wayside. So. Yeah, <clears throat> one thought, it's funny, I had a partner um, a number of years back who uh, anytime we'd present a new deal idea um, and wanted him to take a meeting, he'd be like, you know what? This is a bad space, this is a bad deal. Don't confuse me by letting me talk to management. And that may be an extreme view, but I mean, his point was, you know, I, I kind of can look at some business fundamentals around that what's being presented, 
And I can, based on you know, 25 <coughs> years of in being an investor, recognize that this fundamentally just isn't a good model, it isn't a good space, but you're gonna bring in this management team, they're gonna be very personable, they're gonna be really smart, they're gonna have a lot of charts, and they're gonna get me excited. And down the road, I'm gonna realize I was right, but I had fun with these guys, and we had a lot of board meetings and things, and that's a bit of an extreme, but I guess my point is, is that um, I'm amazed how often when we're doing diligence on a deal, particularly in devices, you call you know, a bunch of GLG calls or whatever, what resources you're using, you get guys that love what you're talking about. You got guys that never think it's going to work. You got guys that think it's approved when it isn't. You got guys, you've been on the market for six years. They're like, they're never going to get their approval. It's a, <clears throat> I do think one of the hard things about being both a CEO and an investor in this regard is you kind of have to step back from all that noise that you end up drumming up as part of your diligence and kind of ask yourself fundamentally, does this make sense? Like just looking at it from a business standpoint, is, this, is it solving a problem? Um, is it cost effective? Is someone generating more revenue or reducing costs as a part of this? So I think that. You know, a lot of these things we look at, I think one of the challenges is you really do have to step back from some of these opportunities um, and really just look at it independent of some of the views by the parties that are most close to it uh, and develop kind of a more of a business thesis around, you know, is this something that I logically can see getting traction and why? You know, then kind of use your, your networks and, you know, diligence to kind of fill in where those gaps are. Again, just a view, but I think that's are there, to it. And anybody can answer this. Are there common reasons for the fall off you know, particularly in situations where you've got that early enthusiasm, is it, you know, is it generally technology related? You know, they thought the product was going to perform a little better than it did, and they start to see it after, it, depending on what we're talking about, the relevant level of follow-up. Is it, you know, if you take a situation with a surgeon whose time is money, that it's taking them longer, or they're getting paid less for it than they thought they would? Does anybody have any kind of common experiences throughout the gamut that, that can inform us as we look at deals, as we look at, at building companies? I, I think, at, le at least in our space, it could be a combination of a couple things because of the nature of the space. It could be that you have over-promised on what the device can do mm -hmm. or the technology behind the device, <coughs> but it's also the ability to service. Our, our business is a very high-touch service model. It is not one where you just call an order from a wholesaler that the truck pulls in and you know, somebody in the warehouse picks it up and delivers it to you. It's, it's a very intimate, personal, high-touch business. So that plays a significant role. So many times what you look at you know, are one of those two reasons. Uh, what I do is I maintain a weekly dashboard for every sales rep in every territory. Is that how many accounts are we signing up? How have they ordered? Are there repeat orders, and are the repeat orders growing? And those are the signals that for us to track and look at this. And so we, we, get, we gauge against that and see as long as the, the business of free ordering is there and the business of free ordering is equal or better than the prior, adjusting for seasonality in our business, then you know something is going. If it's not, then we go out and, and, and ask the questions as to why. And more times than, than, than other, it's just service than the product itself in our case. Yeah, I, I think part of it, um, in some of the cases we've seen on companies with, with some, it is a ease of use, you know, talking to some physicians, they look at it and say, okay, you know, they'll be blunt about it, and they'll say, that's, you know, it has better features, it's probably even more effective, but it's like, you know what, it's adding, it, you know, the delivery <coughs> of this is adding two minutes to my, my, my procedure, it's driving me crazy, I'm just not gonna deal with it. You know, I'm, I'm so used to this, the other device, our, that is better, but I don't want to use it. And you sit there like, really? And they're like, yep, done. Don't that's even want to deal with it. That's probably one of the bigger, one of the many differences between you know, investing in pharma and devices, right? Because yeah. <clears throat> if you have a marginally better therapeutic, they'll give it a shot. Um, whereas yeah. if it impacts their day-to-day, -day, maybe not so much. Yeah. yeah. I guess I would just add from, uh, and, and maybe just throw this out to the panel just for, for a reaction. You, you know, being involved in a number of different situations over time, either from an M&A perspective or from a financing perspective and doing diligence, I mean, lots of times you'll see sort of adoption rates uh, sort of fault or, or slow um, for a variety of different reasons, including some of the ones that you guys just talked about, whether it's product features and performance or whether it's just not uh, uh, delivering on, on, uh, on some of the promises initially made. But, you, you know, we often wind up in, in this, particularly for earlier stage companies, with this tension, if you will, between rapid adoption and making sure that the product is being rolled out in a, in a very disciplined and careful way and that the service and training component of that, which you probably don't have in a pharmaceutical model, which is very important in a, in a device model, sometimes the, the sort of tension of pushing things too quickly and too rapidly uh, can sometimes you know, result mm -hmm. in users who aren't properly trained or using the product 
and develop a bad dynamic around that product capability. I'm just wondering if you guys have had any sort of experience or exposure to that and would share some of those views. Yeah, I mean, I, I know our, uh, we have a, a neurovascular group. As you can imagine, it's, it's pretty neat stuff, but also a um, lot of issues. If you think of putting up a very, very small device through your femoral artery all the way into your brain to, take, to deal with an aneurysm. And you're right, they do. They're fanatical about sitting with a doc for the first time, probably five procedures, and not leaving their side right. until they understand what's going on. And uh, because it is such a, um, it is a very touchy-feely procedure when it comes to getting up into your brain to be able to deliver a, a, a device. And um, so that group, we have sections of group. Other ones just, they just roll, just right roll out. them out. <laughs> and, they're, and they're good to go. <laughs> but, um, but you're right, th those are the groups. It takes longer, and you're right, there's some pressure More for cost. our management yeah. team because you can see the docs like, this is great, I want to, I I want to start using it. But they're like, nope. We're not. We're going to let you do another one with us. Another one with us, and we're not going to let you go just yet. So, there is. There are times like that, and I think sometimes when we haven't done that, we have jeopardized the launch of a product right. and then slowed it down. We put a lot on the front end on that, Bob, because we've seen, and I think it boils down to a certain degree to, to product differentiation, because we've seen a number of, of assets, a number of products where you can launch them, you get that first bolus of users, but then you recognize that you know, the product may have some nice features, but unless the rep is in with the dock, whatever it is, every case, right. twice a week, three times a month, if he's not there, they're probably gonna use somebody else's mm -hmm. product or whoever's the rep that's in there at, at any given time. So, and that impacts the profitability of, of, of the sales sure. force and the ability to actually generate the right kind of rep. And it's an interesting decision as you look at these products. And don't underestimate a large strategic like us really making sure that technology doesn't get adopted. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> we have some competitors who are quite good at that stuff. Um, but they, I mean, you can be very good about, you know, surprisingly it's not on the shelf. Right. And someone wants to use it and it's just like, nope, it's nope. not going to be on the shelf. And so yeah. there, there's, and that's what I mean, there's, there's also, there's a competitive dynamic that it, it's hard to underestimate when, um, you're out there and you're going to go you know, you're to that point on the nail sticking up against a large strategic. Yeah, if it's getting a little bit too dicey, you know, there's some things you can do. And I think uh, Mike, Mike also brought up a good point about continuing the data collection. This is another thing that we try to do as well is we need to, in some cases, we are competing against pharmaceutical companies or medical device companies. Now, for those in the farm world, of course, no. They're very good at doing clinical studies, and they're very good spending money and making sure they have the right <coughs> patients in the clinical study, such that we have to predict, OK, we could acquire this device, but two years later, there's going to be a competitive response on the clinical side. How does that play into our strategy when we acquire the, the product, or, or if it's another strategic that we may have? They're, going to, they're not just going to sit there and say, that's great, you know, take my market away. They're going to find ways to, whether it's more, and they can do it with a good clinical trial, can do a lot of damage to us. I think, too, in the United States, you know, we tend to think about the U.S. as this monolithic market, right? It's 300 million people. In the case of orthopedics, you know, there's 25 or 30,000 doctors. There are controversies everywhere. And so the idea of breaking the U.S. market into something smaller, you know, to, to enter Germany, you'd say, okay, let's put something together to serve an 80 million person market, or France, 60 million, or you know, UK, 70 or 80. And so a staged introduction in the, UK, in the United States can sometimes be helpful too. I mean, some of, the, some of the clinical preferences on the West Coast or in Chicago or Dallas or Orlando are different than they are at HSS here in New York. Uh, so, and so we have to sort of try to understand those nuances and subtleties as we, as we roll this out because a cookie cutter model in, in the U.S. Is, it typically doesn't work across the entire you know, spectrum of customers and hospitals, even though the indications are the same and they're treating the same, the same problem, uh, the, doctors, the doctors aren't always handling it quite the same way. Well, so, so Michael, you come out of this from a, a very different perspective, having launched the product in Europe and only now coming to the U.S. Yeah. And maybe we can talk about it more broadly, but it, there is this age-old question that we deal with in, in medical device companies or many medical device companies of the value of 
we'll focus it on Europe or, or, mm -hmm. or OUS, the mm -hmm. value of generating revenue. Right. You know, oftentimes the strategy, because the uh, you know, the agency has become more and more challenging with their regulatory st right. stringency, that we've got companies that are in their their U.S. approval process while generating revenue <laughs> elsewhere. And, to some degree, it's a test case. To a certain yeah. degree, it's it's got another purpose. How do you think about it now, coming from your perspective, where you've been able to generate market knowledge yeah. uh, and now bring that to the U.S.? Yeah. Well, first of all, the pricing is very different in Europe, mm -hmm. and so if you if you if you can make money, if you can run, if you can launch and, and, and build a franchise profitably uh, in in any of the European countries, um, then there's a pretty good chance that you can be more profitable uh, in the United States. I think secondly, uh, particularly in, in the case of the UK, um, you know, the, the data requirements to, to get a product fully adopted and, and secure the highest level of reimbursement are, are significantly higher than simple 510K or what's, what's required here in the US. So we really see it not just as non-dilutive financing while you're trying to sort of sort out your your PMA path in the United States, but it really does provide some insight into into validating business models and and, and market and market models. Um, and and you know there is a little bit of a chauvinism here in the United States, and and what you know we have to sort of remind surgeons in the United States of is that in orthopedics anyway. Maybe with the exception of biologics, there have been virtually no innovations here in the United States. This is simply a massive market to exploit technologies, you know, created, refined, and developed somewhere else. In our case, it happens to be the UK. Um, and, and, and so, you know, once, once we, uh, you know, in the case of Stanmore, it's been providing many of these products or ver earlier versions of today's products for. 40 or 50 years. You know, we've got some patients who have 25 years of clinical history with our product. And so we have to sort of take that data and capture it and bring it to the to the US doctors to try to help them understand, you know, unlike unlike the US where there is no virtually no registries at the moment. I mean, I know there's an emerging <coughs> registry field in the US, but you know, in the UK it's got maybe with the exception of Australia, the most sophisticated registry system in the world. So being able to, to, to perform and, and work there improves our chances, we think, of, of being successful here. But nonetheless, we still have to target what we do here. Uh, it, my, Mike Brink brings up two very key points. The, one, the first one is the market segmentation. We tend to get very impatient from a investors and management when we got a product that is differentiated or unique, to want to jump into the U.S. market and just kill the competition and do everything up front. And, and, and that requires a tremendous amount of discipline on the part of a CEO, as well as managing the board and their expectation. I've had the experiences in both uh, at Enamed in 2001, we got the lap band approved, the banding system. And the second point to Mike's uh, amplifying that point is the fact what really helped is the ability that have had that product outside the US for a longer period of time. So clinical excellence and the way you need to proctor have been well established in terms of data and how to approach it. So that became very, very important. And at Inamed at the time, we will not allow any doctor to use the device unless they've gone through the training, but also the proctoring. They actually had to go to somebody else. We had a similar situation for the past year in the United States with Cientra, where we had an atomically shaped device approved. Those were, have been available around the world since the early <coughs> 90s, so that their, their history is our future. And so what we end up doing is that we had to walk, because now the surgeon has to think three-dimensionally instead of having a round implant, just putting it in. If it rotates, who cares? And so, again, not a single surgeon was able to use our device without first going through the training, but most importantly, our rep was there on the first surgery with them. So when you look at those two aspects of market segmentation and how you manage this market and being timid about it because my belief is on the lab band, not only because of the changes in, in, in what's sexy or not, <coughs> the, you know, in, in terms of the market, but I think at, at some level, and, and this is not a criticism about Aragon or Covidian, 
but at some level, it, it, it went outside the boundaries of what that product was intended because we get in front of ourselves <coughs> about we want to kill gastric bypass. And what we're finding now is the market is rebounding the other way against that. And, and the data outside the United States have told you, the indicators have told you, that there's the beginning, there's the middle, and there's the end. Those are your boundaries you need to stay within. And we went outside. The most surprising thing about what you said was that you actually put a lot of thought into having to manage your board. So yeah, yeah. I always thought our it's expectations a waste of time. were always <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a good board, David. Is there. And, he, and he pays me a lot of money. <laughs> Millions of dollars. <laughs> um, so, so, Bob, you've had a chance, I'm sure, to, to work with uh, dozens of companies who, who are commercial outside right. the U.S. and then look to monetize their assets, whether or not they're commercial in the U.S. at the time, right. approved in the U.S. at the time. How, how do you find the value of U.S. sales uh, translates when you're trying to pitch the asset to, to folks like Dennis and others? How valuable is it? Um, uh, you know, it's an interesting, and you're right, I think you started out by saying it's sort of an age-old question. It is, it is an age-old question, but, um, but, but I think the strategy and response to that question has clearly sort of changed over time to some, to some degree. Um, if you think back to sort of, you know, the, the, the early part of the 2000s, you, you know, it was all about, you know, new innovations, rapid adoption of new technologies, whether they were truly innovative or just sort of tweaks to existing technologies. There was lots of reimbursement. Uh, and so the, the, the costs associated with driving, you know, an FDA approval here in the States, you know, you could sort of look at that opportunity and feel reasonably comfortable that that was a huge market opportunity and get a, 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 you know, a reasonable return on that, uh, on that capital. You know, you know, what we're finding today is, is as we go around and talk to companies, is, is uh, many of them, not just ones here, ones outside the United States, but ones in the United States are, are sort of looking at that, that cost and that uncertainty in, a, in an environment where there's utilization pressure and pricing pressure and uh, longer and more costly trials you know, required by the FDA and, and, uh, and looking at that and saying, you know, maybe there's an easier way to sort of develop and gain some commercial traction and sort of prove out the concept and the product by doing it uh, by doing it outside the U.S. So, you, you know, you've got trials that are substantially smaller in scale, uh, O.U.S. Um, and therefore less costly, and time to market is therefore much quicker outside the U.S. Typically, depending again on, on the type of technology and the risk of that technology, um, but. But I would say time to, you know, accessing the market is, is a little different than driving adoption. So even though you may be able to gain access to a commercial market outside the U.S. very quickly, and I think, Mike, you may have touched on this as well, my, my, my experience has been the time to actually drive reimbursement and market adoption when you sort of put all of that together isn't all that different from, uh, you know, from, from the U.S. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, we find lots of smaller companies that are able to generate revenue and frankly sometimes very profitable revenue outside the U.S. and that definitely has more value I think today than it did, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Um, but it's a slower growth trajectory typically and, you know, some of that data is going to be usable in terms of getting a U.S. approval. Some, some of it won't be depending on how you've designed those, those, uh, those trials and, and that clinical um, uh, component. So. Uh, is it more valuable? Yeah, I think it's more valuable and, and there's things to be learned. And it's a different model, right? It's sort of lower cost, uh, lower, uh, lower capital requirement, but probably not the same as explosive growth opportunity, sort of just focusing on U.S., I mean, just focusing on uh, O.U.S. So it's, a, it's just a different model, and, uh, and, but more and more people are using sort of a strategy outside U.S. to sort of prove that concept and, and commercialization. So, and this is a tangential topic, but how, does, how do we think about breadth versus depth? And that could be geographic breadth versus depth, you know, whether we're talking about different countries, uh, both outside the U.S. And, and different geographies within the U.S., as Mike, you referred to earlier. There, there are very different characteristics of, of clinical populations and patient populations inside the U.S. Again, with an eye towards building value, inherent value in our companies, is it important to show that you can be successful in different contexts, or do you gain more value from focusing on several narrow bands from, a, uh, from a, a breadth standpoint and showing that you can 
take market share, get reorders, build usability and, and uh, information that you can then turn around and, um, and, and use to prove out your thesis with the potential buyer? I think both, both extreme or both ends are, are very valid and valuable, and, and I've been on, on, on both. It, when we arrived at Inamid in 2001, we put together a blueprint that now, 12 years later, is still the playbook that everybody is following, and that is having, a, in the aesthetics world, having a breast implant, having fillers for wrinkle correction, having toxins, and so on and so forth. So you saw Allergan doing that, uh, you see now Valiant doing that, Medicis attempted that prior and so on. So everybody is going for owning basically the patient regardless of what their aesthetics needs are. I tend to believe that if you look at the market around the world, including the U.S. and the segmentation within the U.S., I believe in plastic surgery there is a, an important vertical and distinction between what is minimally to non-invasive versus surgical. And our view is that we need to focus on the surgical piece of plastic surgery. And that's what we're focused on, not only in the U.S., but also futuristically in the expanding our uh, global footprint or geographic footprint as outside globally. So I believe once you establish yourself and you have the solid foundation, then you can look at reversing that playbook and saying, I'm very entrenched in the surgical side, and I'm very <coughs> satisfied with the growth and the areas where I'm going at. Are there additional things that I can put on top of that platform for my surgeons that can help them with the surgery or to the minimally uh, invasive? And, and so my view is that both models are very valid models that depend on the circumstance and where you are in the trajectory or your life cycle of your company. It's inconceivable a company like Sientra can go today and grow across uh, the breadth of the spectrum of everything that, that we talk about in aesthetics. When we were at Intimate, it was a different story. Um, Dave, you've been, uh, you've been silent. So I'll, I'll That's unusual. Up. Um, <laughs> let, let's, let's take it back full circle to you know, the investment side of this. You know, we're, we're both at firms that invest in a wide range of asset classes, you know, venture growth, public equities, um, small buyouts. How do you think of a growth? What characterizes a growth investment in med tech in terms of when do you want to be getting in? When do you want to be getting out? How do you think of what your, your ultimate return profile is for those companies and to make it a successful investment for you and for the firm? Yeah, so we, and because we invest across a wide range, I mean, so our range, as I said earlier, is anything from venture to public. <coughs> and within that, we've even got categories of subcategories, much like uh, Zubin's slide, I think, from Galen's standpoint. You've got, you've got venture, um, early venture, late venture, you know, a bucket that I think NEA came up with the acronym venture growth, growth equity, uh, buyouts, what have you. I think that, you know, my background and my, you know, um, efforts at having are definitely more growth oriented than more venture oriented. Um, I think what we've decided internally to do when we kind of talk about what's a growth equity deal versus a late venture deal is really to frame it or characterize it more from the standpoint of what will we, what will we have to have done commercially at the time of exit? What will we have to have accomplish before we can exit this deal and let that be the metric? So in the case of a growth equity deal, whether the company has revenues on the day we make an investment or they're on the cusp in the case of Hanny's business, what have you, um, we're going to have to be a commercially successful, commercially viable business for it to, you know, in our minds, be a growth equity deal uh, at the time of our exit. I think late venture is more the case where uh, we may, you know, advance some milestones and make some progress in various programs or initiatives, but there's a good chance that we're kind of thinking we're going to get taken out of that deal before we have to really commercialize the business. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong. That's just how we've chosen um, chosen to take a look at it. And part of the reason we do that is that I think one of the mistakes in particular venture investors have made over the years when they start to want to invest in later stage rounds and do more in the way of growth equity um, is seeing businesses that may have 15, 16, 18, 20 million in revenue and assume because of that existence of revenue base, uh, they're far less risky than most of the venture deals they typically do just by the nature of the fact that you have customers when in fact um, there's still an awful lot of risk inherent in a lot of these businesses. The models may well not be proven out. You may just be riding the coattails of the early adopters. Um, so I do think that's one way that you really have to be careful. And so. The reason we choose to look at it that way as best we can um, is to try and minimize, um, you know, when we're thinking about portfolio management, we don't want to make a bunch of what we think are growth equity deals that we wake up in five years realize, realize really had venture risk and we didn't develop a portfolio accordingly. And I'd say that as far as devices go in terms of life cycle and stage, you know, one of the questions we get asked by LPs a lot is, 
if your bias is to invest in later stage device businesses, are you giving up return by not participating earlier, uh, by being an early round investor? And I think the answer for us lately has been, um, we don't think so. Uh, I think the world is changing. Um, it's taken a lot more time and a lot more money to get things through approval. You know, uh, you thought you were going to get a deal done by the B or C round, it's the E round. So I think that um, what we've tried to do from a growth equity standpoint within devices is really focus on one, theoretically at least trying to invest in kind of the one and done philosophy. We really do want to be, have this be the last round prior to an exit. So thinking about the capital almost as bridge capital to an exit. Um, so I think that's one way to look at it. And, and I think if I look, one metric that I've tried to use, there's certainly going to be some deals that the syndicates keep the values high enough. We're just not ever going to be able to get in late. Um, and it doesn't mean it would have been a good or a bad deal, but it's, there's no execution there. I think the, um, and the latest deals we've done, I think there's more rational pricing. We've all both had deals that we're worried about our pre-money and we're doing deals we're worried about the pre-money. Um, and I think that most of the more recent deals I've looked at, the alignment between the B, the C, the D on pricing is actually pretty aligned, which, is, which I think is telling about have you really given up anything by coming in later? Mm. Um, and the net benefit you have by coming in later is that you're in it at effectively the same pricing, um, but you've probably saved yourself a few years and a lot of aggravation. Um, and probably you're going to look at better IRRs, assuming it is, in fact, the last round. We've got lots more we can talk about with this group, but I'm watching the time tick down. I want to make sure we, we open it up for, uh, for uh, some questions in, in the last couple of minutes here. Anybody? Perfect. You have amazed and entertained. <laughs> 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 well, put them, yeah. put them to sleep. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>